Okay, good morning, OUSD. Um, we are so happy to be here and happy to have you. Uh, welcome to the second of our English Language Learner webinar series. We will be hosting a webinar focused on the needs of our English language learner and multilingual learners each Friday, um, starting today at 11 a.m. Uh, my name, by the way, is Nicole Knight. I'm the Executive Director of ELMA, and I'll be introducing our other panelists in a few minutes. Uh, before we jump in, just want to say, um, please, and, and I want to invite you to use the chat feature to introduce yourself and let us know, you know, who you are, what you teach, so we know who's uh, in the room, so to speak. And uh, we want to encourage you to use the chat to, um, you know, comment, provide some of your own ideas, as well as the Q&A for questions so that we can be as responsive as possible. Last week, Monday, we opened our series with an introduction to the English language learner essential practices adapted to this distance learning context. Uh, we had great participation, so some of you may um, be joining us for a second time. And we heard in that webinar from you a need for a deeper dive in how to support newcomer students specifically. So today we've brought together members of our ELMA instructional team. If you can see them, they're going to wave right now. Um, as well as our student services team to discuss both academic and non-academic supports. So what we'll cover today, uh, next slide, Tom. We're gonna go over an overview of resources and approaches to support instruction for newcomers and provide examples that rely on varying levels of access to technology from you know, full on online to what we're calling low to no tech. And then we know on a lot of people's minds uh, are the non-academic and socially emotional needs of newcomers. So please know the second half of the webinar, we will be focused on that. Before we jump in, just want to note that we, um, two things. One, the link to the slide deck is available um, at the tiny URL on the bottom of each slide, except for this one, but on all other slides, you'll see a tiny URL and you can find the slide deck there. And also, uh, Tom, if you could click into um, our Google site, this is actually attached to a subpage of the Teacher Central. Uh, and here you will find our essential practices document. You can click in there and get into all the links. Many of the resources we're providing today are also referenced there. So this is a great document to bookmark for yourself. And then also know we have, um, we're building and continuing to develop resources and posting them in these Google Drive folders. Um, there's some links to apps. And if you go all the way down, this is where you're gonna see our professional learning webinars. So the one that we did last week is there. And once we have the recorded version, for those of you who can't stay with us, you will find it posted there. Uh, so we can go back to the deck and um, to the next slide. Here you'll see our five essential practices. Um, and we're not going over all of them today. Uh, today. Um, instead, we're zooming in on three that we feel are really most relevant in thinking about our newcomers in this, in this remote learning context. Uh, so first, how are we supporting our students' language development through Essential Practice 2, Integrated and Designated ELD? How do we do this while taking an ask based approach to our students and finally how do we think about the whole child and what resources we can uh, we can leverage to mitigate the many non-academic barriers to learning so with that I'm going to turn it over to our instructional specialist James and Amy who will take you through the first half of the webinar if you're just joining us um, please let us know who you are on chat and um, pose any questions you have in the Q&A um, and uh, Amy you can take it away Okay, thanks, Nicole. So I, I'm Amy Stauffer, a secondary language specialist with ELMA, and we'll start by talking about Essential Practice 2, which is integrated and designated ELD. Uh, we know that being out of the classroom presents a challenge for daily practice and exposure to English for our newcomer students, and Essential Practice 2 is about how are we ensuring our newcomer students are practicing English every day? Um, next slide, Tom. Um, so because students will be accessing material and lessons at different times during 
the week in a distance learning context, we should think about our target language over a series of lessons. So what essential language will we focus on, including vocabulary and sentence frames? And what will we target on Monday and then reinforce throughout the week? Um, you can see here, there's an, this example is highlighting how the verb to feel changes when describing um, different people. And we can introduce the target language on Zoom meetings and, and record our framing on YouTube so uh, students can listen multiple times. And we've also linked a language resource folder um, to give examples of language resources like differentiated sentence frames. And there's also um, a link to a sample plan, um, both in a distance context and paper, um, con if, uh, hard copies, PDF form. Um, all right, next slide, Tom. So essential practice two is all about how we provide regular opportunities for student talk, discussion, and written output. And all of this should be grounded in text. So how are we thinking about ways students engage in the, in the four domains of language? Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. We'll give um, a few examples of what these four domains look like in a distance learning context. And we also recognize that our newcomer students are in many cases most impacted by not having access to tech. So our examples include possibilities with full tech access and also give options for a range of tech dependency. Okay, so for each domain of language, we'll offer a strategy and some examples. So for the listening domain, our key strategy is listening with a purpose. And this is about before giving listening practice, we know that L's benefit from knowing what they're listening for, as opposed to a more common practice, which is you giving a checking for understanding question after listening. So Tom, if you can link on the um, article that's attached, um, you can um, take time to go into this uh, on your own time, but this article gives seven ways of, seven types of activities for listening for a purpose. And you can see, you know, we can have students listen for meaning, like main idea and detail, um, but we can also have students listen for language, like vocabulary or sequencing signal words or specific, specific phrases and expressions. And also on the slide, um, if you get, click back to the slides, Tom, you'll see some examples of tools for listening practice in a distance classroom. And um, Google Read and Write is great. It gives um, two options for listening because it allows you to record your own voice as a teacher. And then also uh, um, you can put your cursor over it as a student to read the text on the page. So it's a great tool. It combines listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, some low tech options. In, for listening, include listening to YouTube or Instagram videos, um, or of course, just having a phone conversation with a teacher um, when the teacher is modeling target language. Okay, so next slide, Tom. So we know that having multiple opportunities to speak in English is critical for our students to develop their language. So the key strategy for the speaking domain is one you, many of you have probably used in your classrooms, stronger and clearer. And um, this strategy gives students multiple opportunities to respond to a prompt and listen to other students respond to the same prompt. And then these multiple turns in speaking and listening help students elaborate on their ideas and use more concise language. In a distance classroom, stronger, clearer could happen in breakout rooms during a Zoom call, um, or could be simulated asynchronously uh, by using an app like Flipgrid. So Flipgrid allows the teacher to post a prompt and then have students record a response to the prompt 
and listen to classmates respond to the same prompt. There's lots of apps and tools out there for students to practice speaking in a distance classroom. Some are listed here, but we're going to see an example of how one of our teachers has been using Flipgrid to provide listening and speaking practice to his students. Um, so you can see um, this is Mr. Zacker. He is a newcomer teacher at Westlake Middle School, and he's had lots of success when, especially when using prompts that are about students' lives. Um, and so here you can see his prompt is, uh, during this time that you've stayed at home, what new skills or information have you learned? And Mr. Zacker's own example was about learning how to be a tomato farmer. And you can see his excellent drawing of a tomato plant here. Um, and now let's listen to, let's actually go to Flipgrid. So Tom, if you can go in, it's really easy to access um, Flipgrid. You just log in with your um, OUSD Google account. And um, we're first gonna listen to um, Lee's response. Um, so I'll have Tom click on her, yeah. Just waiting for this. I'm staying home for a long time. Hi everyone, I'm Lee. So I'm staying home for a long time and new skill or information I have to learn is my, my sister teach me how to dry clothes because she go work on day and she don't have a time to do that. And she taught me for help her to do that. So my parents teach me how to cook fried rice because that is my favorite food. And I cannot do that before. And they helped me to do that. So bye. <laughs> okay. So thanks, thanks, Lee. Dry glass and fried fried rice. And um, you'll see I'm gonna have Tom click on Mr. Zacker's um, response now. And this is an example of him giving feet of oh, let him talk. Good job so far, everyone. Um, let's try and add a little more detail to our responses. So for example, um, Hanin, show us a picture of what you drew. Uh, we'd love to see that. Hapsira and Adderall, that's wonderful that you have been cooking. Uh, what have you been cooking? Who's been teaching you how to cook? What is the recipe for what you made? Uh, yeah, let's make them a little bit longer and keep up the great work. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, so yeah, that's a great example of Mr. Zacker. Um, giving leveraging this tool to give specific feedback and pushing them to stretch their language um, and i saw nicole writing this the a, a lot of um, teachers have also been finding that students are more comfortable when they put an emoji or something over their face if they're uncomfortable with showing their face or their background um, so i encourage you to join mr zacker's class grid you can click on the top like like tom did um, or create your own um, all right, so we're on to reading. You want to be sure that our speaking, listening, and writing are all grounded in text. Um, this could be written text or um, even a movie as a text. Or um, And this, our third language domain for essential practice two is reading. And we introduced uh, this frame, the key strategy that's here um, in our first webinar. And it's the before, during, and after routines. Um, so, you know, just quickly, you can read more details, but before reading a text with L's, we want to make sure we activate prior knowledge and um, build background information. And during reading, um, providing audio support. So again, just highlighting that wonderful tool of Google Read Write. Um, also chunking the text throughout. And, um, then after reading, we should consider like multiple ways to respond to the text. So maybe recording a response on Flipgrid <laughs> or um, Instagram voice, teachers have been playing around with a lot. Um, or of course, a low tech option would include taking a picture of a written response or um, having a phone call conversation to discuss what um, students read. Okay, so then, um, 
part of the re reading domain for our newcomer students includes a foundational literacy skills. So like phonemic awareness and practicing with sight words. And here we have an example from Miss Rand, who's an elementary newcomer teacher leader at Garfield Elementary. And she uses Quizlet to review sight words with her students. And she's recorded how she accesses and practices with Quizlet on this YouTube video. Um, and it's great that it's recorded because if students don't understand the first time, they can watch again and again. So, so Tom, if you can show the video from the start and stop at a minute and 10 seconds. Hello students, it's Ms. Hello students, it's Ms. Rand here again. It is so good to see you. Thank you as always for watching my videos. For today's lesson, I have some sight words for you to be practicing. So you will see the sight words kind of on like a flashcard. It's on the computer. And then it'll be like we did last time. It'll be kind of like a little game. Um, I'm going to show you the flashcard and then I'm going to give you maybe like two seconds and I want you to try to say it before I say it. And then I will show you how to use it in a sentence so that you understand how to use the word. So let's go ahead and look at those now. All right, here is your first word. Try to say it before I do. All. All of my friends went to the party. Okay, next one. Try to beat me. R. Where are you going? As. He is as tall as me. Okay, thanks, Tom. So um, just as a reminder, that was Miss Rand um, sharing her ways of using sight words um, through Quizlet and then recording it on <clears throat> YouTube. And she's generously shared a link to her YouTube channel for um, more videos, um, even including some read alouds that showcase, showcase how to teach foundational um, literacy skills. And just as a reminder for those of you um, just joining us, welcome. Just a reminder, there are, um, you can find the, all of these slides are available at the tiny URL posted at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so again, um, we'll move on to our last domain in um, Essential Practice 2, uh, Integrated and Designated ELD, and it's um, writing. So in addition to output through speaking, we want students to have practice with output in English through writing. Um, and we can revisit Stronger Clearer as a key strategy <clears throat> for writing. Uh, there's lots of tech tools with tons of opportunity for student collaboration and revision. Uh, some include Nearpod, Padlet, Google Classroom, and then uh, a low tech tool would be to have, um, just as we've mentioned before, have students take photos of their work. Um, or we've been hearing that a lot of teachers are finding students are more easily able to access Google Forms on their phones and they've been writing responses through Google, form, Google Forms. Okay, so um, finally, just wanting to emphasize again how distance learning is different, uh, as, as you all know, than in-person learning. <clears throat> and so just reminder that students will access learning opportunities at different times during the week, as I mentioned um, in the beginning of this um, essential practice. So this kind of gives an outline of how the four domains of language uh, show up in a weekly plan. So um, when are students listening and reading and writing and speaking? And this is a really high level view and there are more detailed samples linked on this slide. Um, and on our website. So feel free to return to this slide and all of the slides for more details. Um, I'm gonna, going to pass it on to James. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see a lot of familiar names within the chat box. My name is James Kindle and I'm one of our elementary language specialists. I'm gonna be talking to you about Essential Practice 4. So Essential Practice 4 is talking about an asset-based approach. And so this is the idea that distance, during distance learning, we really wanna remember 
that our students' home language and culture are important assets to their learning, and that their families are funds of knowledge that provide a lot of natural learning opportunities. Go to the next slide. So in this first section, we're going to be talking about what we mean by those, by those things and how that can look in your classroom. Next slide. So we know from research that the skills that students develop in their first language, including literacy skills, can be accessed and utilized as they develop proficiency in other languages. So while it is a big concern for us that during COVID lockdown, students don't have as much access to English speaking peers, students do have ample, opportunity, ample opportunities to be learning by building off their existing schema and within their first language. Next slide. So we need to see our students' families and funds, as funds of knowledge and lift up the expertise of our students' families as avenues for learning. So many of our students' families have a lot of experience working in agriculture or doing sustainable farming. Uh, many work in construction or in mechanics. A lot of our students' families are small business owners and so they have a lot of knowledge about entrepreneurship. Um, this makes all of our students' families fonts of knowledge for our students that we wanna lift up and give students opportunities to talk about this learning that they're doing at home. We already heard how Mr. Zacker is having students share what they've been learning with their family members in Flipgrid. And so additionally, with all of the time students are spending at home, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for them to be reading to or with their families, including within their first language. They can write or illustrate family stories or recipes, like we see in this example on the right on the slide. They can play games with their families. The opportunities really are myriad that for students to develop and use first language to build, their, to build and uh, sustain their learning. Next slide. And so in the same way that we would encourage students to use their first language as a support in traditional face-to-face -face learning, we still wanna do so within the digital learning spaces that we've created. So with assignments, students can be given the opportunity to write or speak in their first language. Um, you could pair students and partner them up when they have a shared first language, and even create like a buddy system if you have helpful students that would like to be sort of distance learning helpers for their classmates that share their first language. Um, sentence frames in multiple language could be posted within assignments on Google Classroom or Seesaw. They could be held up or posted um, during Zoom classes if you're working synchronously, or they could even be shown uh, within YouTube videos. Um, the sentence frames that are linked here are from our wonderful educators from Lockwood or Q's Futures. And just as these uh, sentence frames were being used really successfully within the classroom during the school year, now they can be used really successfully for students as they're learning digitally. Go next slide. One project that we've heard from a lot of teachers that they're having a lot of success with in terms of working with students and allowing students to utilize first language and a project that can also be adapted based on students' access to technology is journaling at home. And so this is something that some teachers at Think College now are doing. So thank you to Michaela Klein, one of a third grade teacher um, over at TCN for sharing these materials. Um, for students with a lot of technology access, they could write their journal entries online in Seesaw or Google Classroom, or they could draw or take a photo of their writing or drawing and post those online. For students whose digital access is more limited, like maybe to a phone, um, you could explain the directions and visuals via a YouTube video like we saw earlier, and then have students maintain their journals analog. For students with little to no digital access, you could enlist an interpreter, and we're gonna hear in a second about um, accessing communi um, community navigators for translation and interpretation um, to explain those directions over the phone, or you could send them via talking points, um, and then encourage them to read or share their entries with family members. Um, we also wanted to, um, to just promote that next week, there'll be a follow-up webinar about documenting your world with a language lens. And so if you come back here next Friday, same time, same place, um, then there'll be opportunities for you to learn more and get ideas around that. Next slide. The other piece that we wanted to talk about is for our students who are in dual language or bilingual programs about the multilingual resources that are out there or resources in other languages besides Spanish. Next slide. So our, our wonderful multilingual team has created this curated list of many resources for supporting students, particularly students whose first language is Spanish. Also, Benchmark Universe is a really great online tool 
that's available for all students. Um, and so schools that have been using uh, Benchmark or Adelante Advance as their curricula, um, there's a lot of options for students to utilize those same materials uh, virtually in the distance learning environment, including text that can be read aloud in both English and Spanish. And you'll see those resources linked on this slide. Next slide. Um, because if you'll see in, in that spreadsheet and within that Google folder, there are so many resources that are available. I asked the multilingual team to lift up a few of the resources that they felt would be the highest utility for, new, for newcomers. They mentioned BrainPop Espanol for building content knowledge in Spanish, and students can access that via Clever, and um, Arbol ABC um, for Spanish games and activities across content areas. Wanted to point out that both of these resources can be totally student self-directed once students understand the format and how to use these online tools. Um, that third bullet is for um, videos de adios de lecturas in Voz Alta. That's a Google Doc featuring a number of read-alouds with um, our wonderful MLA librarian, Laura Gonzalez, and a number of corresponding lesson plans. So students can access those as well. So next slide. So even if you're not working in a dual language or a bilingual context, if you have students whose first language is Spanish, any of these previously mentioned resources can be used to support these students learning in their first language. And, but we also know that there are a variety of other languages that our students use, and so we wanted to highlight some other language resources that are available as well. This first link is for, um, this comes via Ingrid O'Brien, a TSA at East Oakland Pride. She found a number of Guatemalan government resources around supporting mom language literacy. And so um, these can uh, show those to students and support them in terms of uh, looking and understanding ways that mom can even be a printed language. Uh, we have a lot of teachers within OUSD who are creating read aloud videos. These read alouds can be done in a variety of languages, or there are a number of pre recorded read alouds that you can direct students to, like the Arabic language read alouds that are linked here. We also wanted to point out Google Translate is a, a great resource that can be used selectively. So, we emphasize that word selectively for translating key directions or um, select words in assignments. We definitely don't recommend teachers try to translate every single word of an assignment for all of the different respective first languages in their classroom. It's not really sustainable and it could provide a hindrance for students learning um, English, but sort of selectively utilizing it as a tool. There are a number of languages available there. Lastly, um, uh, we've had in the past a lot of um, OUSD teachers that have worked on learning their students' first language. When I was in the classroom, I tried to take a lot of classes to learn Somali, which was the largest language of my students. Um, and so just like a lot of the tools that Amy pointed out, like Duolingo and Rosetta Stone that can be used by students, those are also able to be used by teachers. And so if you're spending some of this time uh, while you're in lockdown working on, a, on learning a language, let your students know and enlist them to help you. It really gives students trem um, tremendous pride. It helps them build their metalinguistic thinking. And it shows them clearly that you both value their, their language and you empathize with them as language learners. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nicole again. Um, all right, thank you, uh, Amy and James. Lots of um, gratitude to the resources that you're both sharing. So um, a couple questions that I wanted uh, to pose. One just came up that James, I think um, you can respond to as, um, how to balance what we want students to be producing in English versus their home language. Can you speak briefly to that? Yeah, absolutely. So it really is going to be based off of um, students' proficiency levels and really trying to figure out what is that zone of proximal development for students. And so for our, our N0s or N1s who are really at the beginning of their English development, you really might just limit to their language production to a few words, short sentences. For our newcomers that have been here a little bit longer and are able to do a little bit more, you can have them producing longer sentences or even a series of sentences or short essays. Um, it really um, based, it's going to be based on your knowledge of your own students and, um, and just seeing them as giving opportunities that within um, utilizing first language to maybe talk with a partner or to even write first and then to then work on them, um, taking what they've written and talked about and putting it into English. Also, we really want to encourage. Uh, uh, 
teachers to um, help students access apps like Brain Pop English Language ELL. It's um, helpful for all grade levels. Is that correct, um, James? Yeah it's, yeah, it's for any newcomer, so, for sure. Yeah, so it's a great way to have them continue to practice in English um, while also giving them opportunities to learn in their home language. One more question before we um, pivot, which is there were several questions around use of Flipgrid and other um, speaking apps for, for our youngest students. Um, so James or Kellith, would one of you like to share a little bit about um, uh, where to find any strategies for how to get our, our, our youngest babies um, connected and using those types of apps. Um, definitely there are young students that are using Flipgrid. A lot of times they do need some assistance from parents just to, to get started with it and to post messages. But um, because it's, it's such a, it's such a, a simple, way to connect with teachers and classmates. Um, it, it really is valuable, especially right now that we're, we're all separated. So we'd really recommend that. Just takes a little bit of time just to figure out the, the setup, but once people get going on it, um, it's, it's really useful. And there are a lot of, uh, if there are privacy concerns, there are a lot of settings that can be set for each. Um, it's called topic or prompt, uh, so that you can choose if, if students see each other. Uh, so highly recommended being used by a lot of OUSD teachers right now. The only thing that I would add, Nicole, is that our colleagues, Daniel Pastrana and Maria Inglés, are, um, in, are working on creating a uh, early elementary webinar that they also were hoping to present in the coming weeks. And so please check Teacher Central to get more information about when that will be coming out. As well as a really great webinar on Flipgrid. So if you want to know all the ins and outs and details, please check OUSD. Um, Teacher Essential, if you can't find the exact webinar, that list is growing, then you can contact any of us um, or Kellett around that. So we are about to um, pivot to our next topic. And before we do, we have a poll for you. So Kellett, if you could um, put our little poll up. We uh, know that um, our newcomers are some of the students who are least likely to be engaging right now because of you know, so many factors. So we just wanted to get a sense from you. If you could uh, please respond to this poll. We know it's an estimate, but what percent of your newcomer students in particular do you estimate have engaged in any kind of distance learning um, with you to date? Uh, um, so if you could... Um, take a little vote and just want to remind you as you're doing that a couple of things especially those who came later um, you can find the um, i see a couple of our slides have the wrong um, link on the bottom so it's it's not this slide but we have a bit um, lee that i've been chatting and it's on the other slides it's called newcomer distance learning so you can access the slide deck and we'll also be returning to, at the very end, we'll show you where to find all of our resources on our OUSD Teacher Central um, English Language Learner page. So all of this is available. And if we go over a resource too quickly um, or you can't find it in our resources, please reach out to us. We're happy to share. You'll also find all of our information, um, contact information on the last slide. So with that, uh, Kellis, could you show us what we have so far with the poll results? Sure, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and end the poll. It looks like um, we've had everyone um, answer who wants to participate right now. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Okay, so you see and the red bar is our highest. So we see, wow, 36% um, of you are seeing very low participation. Um, and, you know, then we kind of have a, a more even split between 20 to 40 and 40 to 60 and an extremely low rate of, of uh, students who are participating at higher rates. So this, um, we just want to recognize that there is a lot going on for our families. And this is why we wanted to make some space for our social, our student services team to share with you some of the resources available, knowing that you know, it's a lot and maybe um, we'll still always feel insufficient, but there are partners within and outside of OUSD that uh, can help you help your students. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tom, my colleague, uh, to introduce himself and get us started on part two. 
Uh, good morning. My name is Tom Felix. I'm the uh, director of newcomer programs for the district, and I'm happy to kind of frame what my colleagues are going to share around Essential Practice 5, uh, which is really um, an acknowledgement that in order for our English learners to thrive, we have to be addressing the needs that are outside of the classroom uh, in their lives and the lives of their families. Uh, and we recognize that teachers over the course of the last several weeks uh, in your engagements with students and families are becoming aware of very serious um, uh, issues facing uh, your students and families and in many cases torn, uh, obviously wanting to respond, but also needing to focus on teaching and not being sure how to respond. And our aim here is not to try to um, train everyone on this webinar to become a social worker, but to make sure that you're aware of some very clear cut information that you might be able to share. And then more importantly, um, aware of the work that's taking place and who are the people within the district and the community uh, with whom you can connect if you um, wanna make sure that uh, everything that is possible is done to address a need that you become aware of. So with that, I want to start by turning it over to uh, my colleague, Rumaili Snyder, who can introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Rumaili, and I'm the social worker at Oakland High School for our newcomer students there. Um, we have 200 newcomers, and I've been trying to connect with all of them around what their needs are at this time. And so I have one teacher who's been kind of helping me do that, and we were sort of seeing what the most prominent needs were. And I created this one page resource guide uh, for her to be able to help families. And then Tom graciously made it um, a little bit prettier and added some additional information so that you all can um, have access. And so it's up on the screen right now. The way it's organized is um, by type of need. And then there's a recommended response and then next steps, more information and recommended referrals. Um, so the, there's kind of three main needs that we've been seeing. Um, the biggest one is financial needs since most families um, or many families have lost income due to COVID and many are not eligible for any kind of government assistance. And Nate's gonna talk a little bit more about that one. Another is internet, which Nate's also going to talk more about. And then the third is food insecurity, which is a little bit easier to address since we have grab and go sites. Um, most of you know about on Mondays and Thursdays at specific school sites, and that's um, the sites are listed on this resource guide as well. And then we also listed information for the Alameda food banks. Um, they have a hotline where you can find out where the closest distribution site is to you where and when you can go for additional food. Um, then we also added some information about mental health and medical concerns that come up, um, who folks can address in particular if they don't have a primary care, where they can go or who they can call. Um, there are therapists who are providing teletherapy right now. Um, and so there are some phone numbers that folks can call here. And then um, we also, the other area of need that um, is mentioned is legal need related to immigration. Um, I think that the main takeaway is really all of the contact information within OUSD. There are gonna be some things on here that you might be able to directly help students and families connect to. Um, but as Tom said, we don't expect teachers to be social workers. And a lot of this is both time consuming and like ever changing. The resources are changing daily. Um, the information you get is different depending on what person you connect to. Um, and so the main thing is knowing, do you have somebody at your site? who is there to support newcomers with this kind of things, and if not, who you can contact at the district. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Nate. Good morning, everyone. This is Nate Dunstan. I'm the program manager for refugees and newcomers. And um, I think many of us are aware that our newcomer students and families are suffering um, 
perhaps more than the average family uh, due to the coronavirus. Uh, this is largely affecting uh, undocumented families disproportionately who are not eligible for unemployment assistance um, through the state, not eligible for the Federal CARES Relief Act, which some of us saw um, refunds coming into our accounts recently. Um, so to address that, there, there are some local funds that newcomer families can access. The Ed Fund has raised a large amount of money to support OUSD families and principals are the point people for uh, allocations from that fund. So you can work directly with principals um, on that if there's a particular, particularly needy family that you're concerned about. And then there are a number of community-based organizations that have different relief funds. If you click on the link at the bottom, you'll see a, a list that we have found to be the most helpful list. There are lots of resource lists circ circulating these days. Um, and there's a, there's a fund that's specifically targeting undocumented families that opens at 2 p.m. today, for example, um, that will be included on that list. Next slide, thanks. Um, and then our office is also identifying certain families to prioritize for um, opportunities from the Ed Fund or other sources. And we're focusing on newcomer families who meet these criteria. So they're not eligible for unemployment insurance and they haven't received a stimulus check from the, from the federal government. Basically that, that probably means that they're undocumented and um, of course, we don't want to ask that question directly, but um, those are the families that are not seeing the, the extra help that many of us are um, able to access. Um, number three, they have lost their job or you know, significantly reduced hours since March. And number four, have really an elevated level of hardship. Um, we're mostly focusing on unaccompanied minors who are um, responsible for paying their own rent and expenses. Those are typically high school age students, uh, homeless families, uh, single parents with multiple children. We have several parents that we're working with that um, recently gave birth. Uh, so if you're at a site with a newcomer social worker like Rumeli or a therapist or another newcomer point person that makes sense to be the liaison, um, please work with them. And if you don't, um, feel free to reach out to me, nathaniel.dunston, uh, and please include my colleague, Coca Vib Revolorio, and happy to answer um, questions on that. So do feel free to reach out. Uh, the, the last thing I'll mention is just, you know, internet access has been a big challenge for a lot of families, and this is, you know, this is not a new issue. Um, Comcast Internet Essentials. In, in my experience has been the, the relatively easier option to access. The requirement is that um, students receive free or reduced lunch at school. So it's a little bit of a simpler um, eligibility than some of the others. Um, and uh, it's like applying for any other um, internet service or, if you've ever tried setting up cable at home, you know, it, it, it does take a couple of steps and some follow through. Um, but the, the most helpful thing that I think we're able to do at this point is often help a family fill out the initial application online, which is fairly simple, uh, to avoid them having to call Comcast and wait on the phone for hours. And if we help them fill out that initial application, that, that gets the application moving and saves some, some time. Okay, and then just to round out this section, uh, I want to share about some resources more broadly in the community and recognizing that uh, newcomers are just one part of the immigrant community in Oakland and many of you are holding needs of other families right now. A, a quick reminder that OUSD's sanctuary policy does uh, forbid all of us from inquiring around the immigration status of our students and families. However, um, families and students frequently disclose that information uh, to school staff, which is their, their discretion. And 
Uh, the resource guide that Rumeli shared earlier does list uh, contact people in the district if you're, fam if you're in contact with families that are naming uh, legal concerns related to their immigration status. There are absolutely people, Nate uh, foremost among them, who you can reach out to if, if that kind of uh, need arises. Uh, so after saying that, I want to also remind folks that the OUSD Sanctuary website has a number of resources that may be of interest to you. Uh, the OEA continues to be one of the strongest advocates in our community for newcomers, and they have a wellness checklist with a comprehensive list of uh, resources. Uh, OUSD uh, school-based health centers are open in a modified way. And finally, the eviction moratorium is very relevant to many of our students and families, and there are guides in, in English and Spanish. So I'm going to um, move uh, back to Nicole for questions. And um, thank you for your attention. Um, okay, so I am um, i don't see lots of questions coming in, so... Um, Let's see. Well, there, there. Actually, before we get to questions, I wanted to ask Romeli to share a little bit about um, immigrant eligibility and um, public charge. There's a really great resource. So maybe Tom, you could go back to the um, specific resource around that. And 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 um, Panna, uh, attendees, if you have questions, this would be a really good time uh, to pose questions. Yeah, Sorry, so which resource? A... The resource guide, Nicole. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I had just chatted to Nicole that I forgot to mention there's a link to a document um, on this teacher resource guide that sort of explains eligibility for different public programs. Um, it can be a bit complicated and this is one of the best documents I've seen for sort of clearly explaining. So if, um, for example, a family does disclose that they're undocumented, you can kind of look through here to see whether they are eligible or not for particular public programs. Thank you, Romeli. So there are a, there are a couple of questions um, around the internet essentials. Uh, so Nate, maybe you know some of these details. Um, well, one is I think a request if teachers could gather names, phone numbers, preferred language, and a good time to call and send the list to um, the district familiar with the process. So I guess it's requesting some um, interpretation support, which might be a good time to reiterate the supports we have, um, but also just hearing a need for maybe um, some uh, talking points or information in various languages, or if that is that already available in terms of getting on being uh, support in applying for internet essentials. Um, sure. So are you going to link the, the translation resources again for folks? I, I think, um, yeah, uh, we can see on the screen, some of the, the resources, I guess I would say if there's some reason that there's nobody at the school site that can communicate with the family and the language isn't listed on this list, then feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think that it's, yeah, the, the language barrier could be an issue. Um, the initial application on the website is several steps um, with some, with just mostly basic demographic information. So I would encourage folks to take a look at it. Great. And uh, I'm seeing requests for, yeah, multilingual information that just can be posted so you don't necessarily have to reach out individually. So that's something we'll go back and talk about. Uh, and then um, we, there's also a question around the letter for free and reduced lunch. Tom, did you want to speak to that? For sure, thank you. I, I meant to mention that or I know we wanted to mention that. So um, actually just today, apparently, uh, principals received communication from Nutrition Services, basically a letter kind of uh, clarifying uh, how broad access to free and reduced lunch is at schools. For those of you who've been around for a minute, it used to be 
very student by student and all of this paperwork and it's gotten simpler and simpler. Um, so there is a letter that principals have that sort of lists schools where there's universal access to free and reduced lunch. And I'm guessing if you're on this call because you're concerned about newcomers, your school is also listed on that paper because it's just about every school in the district. Um, so I would recommend if, um, if documenting that type of issue or um, that type of status is the issue for a family, there is that. I also saw a question around, uh, do you need a social security number to get internet essentials? And the answer is no. Um, if you have one, they'll happily take it, but you do not. There are other ways to, uh, to put forth your identity. Okay, thank you, Tom. So I think that we're about ready to wrap up. Um, uh, just to remember that uh, actually if we can go to the next slide because then you can see there's lots of questions about wait how do i access that information so first of all you can see our contact information is available um, please reach out we are so appreciative of everything that you all are doing to support our students and families and are more than willing to help um, if you don't hear from us right away then just give us a little ping um, again, uh, if, if we don't follow up. And again, uh, this link is for support with interpretation or translation and some of those minority languages we just mentioned. If you um, go to OUSD Teacher Central, there's now an ELL page. So all of this information, the webinar will be posted. And then finally, um, we've posted in the chat several times the bit.ly for this slide deck is bit.ly slash newcomer distance learning. So, um, and if you didn't get all of that, then just reach out to one of us and we are happy to share. Um, and again, we are in service of you. Feel free to reach out. Uh, we thank you for everything that you do. And with that, I think we'll log off. Have a great day and weekend, everyone. Thanks for being here.